Welcome everyone. I'm Tong Thot Ong, uh, Director of AIT Solutions, Asian Institute of Technology. I am host for today's talk. Let me introduce briefly about AIT Solutions and uh, about this talk. AIT Solutions is uh, one of the outreach centers in Asian Institute of Technology. We are the consulting arm of the Institute and we provide the services in Structural, in structural engineering, IT and software development. In our structural engineering services, our primary uh, services are the performance-based seismic design, wind tunnel testing, structural health uh, monitoring of uh, tall buildings and other uh, structures. In software development side, we have uh, a team who is working for the development of the software related to structural engineering and other uh, related fields uh, to deliver the software uh, the development to develop the software based on the needs uh, customized software based on the needs of our clients in addition to that in AIT we are offering AIT is offering the professional master in structural design of tall buildings by the experienced faculties and experts that we, uh, to share our knowledge and experience in our design of the tall buildings, not only in structural engineering, but also in geotechnical engineering and uh, construction management. In the, let me introduce about this talk. In the, in the Meet the Expert talk, we invite the experts in the field of structural engineering and allied fields to share their knowledge and experience through the online session. Let me introduce our speaker today. Dr. Mainhart is the director of TMD Systems in GUB Vibration Control Systems Incorporated. He studied structural engineering at the Technical it's University of Berlin and special and uh, soil dynamics. He started working with Junma Stampers uh, during an undergraduate research and internship at Kartri and Kobori Institute in Japan. Since 2001, he worked in the fields of structural dynamic at the Federal Research Institute of Material Research and Testing. In 2006, he joined Curb Vibration Control System and was in charge of the realization of several large-scale TMD applications for towers and tall building. Let me welcome Dr. Menghart to present supplementary damping for high-rise buildings. If you have any question, please send the message in the chat box. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. Thank you also for the possibility you're giving me to present today uh, about uh, yeah the applications, uh, not only our applications, uh, but uh, applications that we uh, have at tall buildings to increase uh, the structural damping. Uh, just a few words to, to, to the company. Uh, I'm with the Group Vibration Control Systems is uh, providing solutions in the construction business starting from uh, base isolation to protect buildings from uh, traffic, railway traffic induced vibrations from uh, vibrations that are induced by other sources, uh, but also uh, wind and seismic protection. We're also providing track bed isolation systems and we have a very broad application in the industrial and, uh, machinery equipment field, which I will not go into detail. Um, the talk today was inspired by uh, a great presentation we had some weeks ago by Stefano Camelli. Um, and it not only was inspired by uh, this talk, it also picks up right where he left it. Um, the decision, often the most important decision for the uh, designers and even more for the developers or owners of those buildings, does uh, the building need, uh, need supplementary damping? And uh, I want to talk about methods and, and systems, how to achieve the supplementary damping, and give you a small introduction about yeah, structural dynamics for tall buildings. I think um, the earthquake 2011 in Fukushima, Japan, sparked a great interest 
when it comes to structural dynamics. And uh, everybody is probably still has these uh, vivid memories of uh, videos from towers shaking. And I'm just sharing that video with you now. <clears throat> you see uh, that uh, uh, the tower is, is moving a lot and it's quite spectacular when you look at that uh, tall building. So you may see that picture, but what happens exactly with that building? And you can uh, see that by looking at the, uh, yeah, a time history that has been calculated with the modeler, but the input uh, was used from the Fukushima earthquake, where you see the displacement of the building um, and the structural response. The important thing that you see is that we have a very dominant uh, response in the first mode, but we also have some and uh, relatively large displacements. But when you compare or correlate this uh, with the actual uh, base excitation the building had, then you see that uh, what happens to the building is actually happening after the earthquake has occurred. So we put a lot of energy into the building and uh, uh, the building responds, but the far more distinctive response of the building is actually after the earthquake. And that's a very special uh, thing about tall buildings that uh, it is too, the inertia is too high uh, to respond directly, but there is still an energy input and uh, the, the response is based on that energy input. So that's the very specialty about seismic excitation. Um, but we not only having seismic excitation as dynamic excitation, we of course also have wind, what we heard in the, in the, in the previous talk. Uh, and I just want to share some data that we gathered at an actual building. It's a 240 meter tall <coughs> tower in Germany. Uh, southern Germany, which is used for uh, testing elevators. And what you see here is, uh, again, like a time history, this time of the acceleration at the top of the tower uh, with certain wind events. Because when wind events pick up, you have an increased uh, dynamic response. But what's more important is that when you look at the frequency spectrum of the time history, um, and uh, I once heard in a another talk, a nice saying, which says like the information is always in the, in the frequency spectrum. And that is very true in this case too. Um, you see that we have uh, uh, like a dynamic response, which is exactly uh, according to the theory. So we have a background response. So that is the uh, variation of the wind speed and the, very <clears throat> and the variation of the wind gust the time variation, uh, which happens in a broad band uh, frequency excitation, although it is a very low frequency with very long uh, variation periods. But then we have a uh, free response of the tower uh, that we can clearly identify here. I have to say <coughs> for that particular building uh, that was uh, to be expected because it's a circular shape uh, and uh, the building mostly suffers from uh, crosswind excitation from vortex shedding induced vibrations. And that's exactly what you see in the time history as well, that uh, once a critical wind speed has been reached, we have an amplified dynamic response. Um, but the question is why are vibrations so bad? And uh, I think due to the probability uh, that wind events are mostly are occurring much more often than, than seismic events. Um, we can focus also on, on, on wind issues uh, when assessing uh, vibration issues. Yeah, why are vibrations so bad? Um, just like a couple of weeks ago, there was an article in the New York Times about um, the uh, 432 Park Avenue tower, a very slender tower, uh, and the uh, article was uh, uh, titled The Downside to Life in a Super Tall Tower Leaks, Creaks, and Breaks. And that's, of course, something uh, that nobody wants. Um, when you look, for instance, at uh, some video footage of people posting on YouTube how their building, their office building, or their, 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 their residential building is, is swaying, uh, then uh, you think it is definitely a comfort issue. Um, and it's also a serviceability issue. So I have uh, this video, found this video here. Um, I'm not sure, we, we tested the sound before, uh, it didn't work, <coughs> whether you can hear this. Uh, that's a video, you can 
Google it afterwards, where you hear the creak of, uh, of, of uh, partition walls in the building. Um, that is definitely a scary thing for people who don't have the structural understanding that we have. And of course, the video we saw the last time as well was the pool on the top floor overflowing. Um, all uh, viral videos that are classics in the meantime. But uh, which value is relevant to assess uh, whether vibrations are bad or not? And here again, we have to uh, distinguish between seismic and wind excitation, but um, uh, not only between the type of excitation, also uh, the actual vibration values. Uh, we can have a look at the, at the displacements and we see big displacements with a very uh, dominant mode. Uh, and those displacements are uh, causing uh, like interstory drift, uh, which should be limited. Limited again to uh, avoid uh, creak, uh, limited to avoid damage. And uh, the interstory drift is also actually defined in, in the code to be limited by certain values. I just have a small overview of the uh, allowed interstory drift uh, ratio and the limits that are defined in several codes that can be applied worldwide. So displacements are one value to assess the vibrations. But in addition, we also have uh, to look at the uh, accelerations in, in the tower. And the acceleration, uh, that's uh, the simple law of physics, Newton, uh, force is mass times acceleration. So all forces that you can uh, feel that you can sense are based on acceleration values. And when you look at the, the same response, but, uh, com uh, but you compare the displacement and the tau acceleration, then you see that the uh, maximum acceleration for the same Fukushima event that I introduced earlier uh, occurs actually when the earthquake occurs. Uh, and when you look in the frequency domain of this time record, then you see that the building may show or shows big displacements uh, in the first mode, but the acceleration values are much higher for higher modes. And that's why we also have that direct response uh, due to that earthquake. I don't know if somebody is talking. Uh, maybe you mute your microphone in the meantime. Sorry. OK. Um, so those acceleration values are important when it comes to uh, damages, structural damages that can happen in the interior or the mechanical equipment of tall buildings. Uh, very often, if you have like an office building, you have uh, data server racks in, in, in uh, at different floors, uh, which are also then exposed, of course, to the acceleration values. And uh, this should be avoided at some point or what, what you see here in the in the uh, uh, picture on the right is just like the the, uh, the aftermath of, of earthquakes that have happened. So we um, have to look at accelerations and see uh, what is like a maximum acceleration value certain equipment in the building can withstand. Elevators, for example, also operate on uh, acceleration based values. Uh, so they shut off um, once a certain uh, acceleration value has been reached just for safety reasons. So here the value of acceleration is relevant. And in the end for the entire structure, uh, the base moment is important. And again, you see uh, with the base moment compared to displacement at the tower top, you have a difference uh, of, the, of the time history. The base moment is uh, at its maximum already during the earthquake. And that again is because we have or we, we, we sense the vibrations at the, at the base of the tower, not only in the first mode, but also in the higher modes, and that all contribute to the base moment um, more than to the maximum displacement at the tower top. And why is the base moment so relevant? Well, I think it's obvious we try to avoid uh, damages at the, at the base or uh, even worse, uh, like a, a collapse as it is shown here in the picture from a building in, in Taiwan. It's an exemplary picture, I have to say, um, but uh, you can see what can happen. 
So for wind excitation, the situation is a little bit different, as I said, uh, because we have that dominant response in, in the first mode. So again, here we have uh, to look at the displacements in terms of the interstory drift. Um, also for wind, there are <coughs> certain uh, limitations that are defined by the codes. Uh, very similar actually to the seismic uh, uh, limitations, but some codes have a distinguish or are distinguishing not only between the type of building, but also between the actual event, whether it's a seismic or a wind event. More importantly, and that's probably uh, for tall buildings, the, the, the issue number one, there are the accelerations. And here we're talking about comfort levels. So what needs to be avoided is that people that are working, living uh, on top of a tall building, they've paid a lot of money to, to, to live in a nice apartment, uh, are feeling seasick from uh, by, by accelerations that occur during wind events. And there is, uh, has a lot of research been done uh, to define comfort criteria. Uh, they're using uh, motion simulators, ship motion simulators, just to simulate the, the acceleration values and have like assessments with people do you feel anything can you is it is it perceptible um, is it bothering etc and from all this information there are some of the uh, comfort criteria that are commonly used uh, in the design of tall buildings uh, can be derived so um, the most common criteria is the criteria according to the iso 10137 uh, code, uh, which distinguishes between office and uh, residence buildings and uh, uh, refers to winds that occur with a return period of one year. Um, that uh, diagram that uh, I took from a work from Melissa Burton um, also defines the perception thresholds where you see, okay, you can already perceive the, the, the accelerations at the very at a smaller level, but you don't think they are perturbing yet. And uh, also in Japan, there were like a lot of, uh, there was a lot of research about uh, that issue. So uh, this is another summary of the uh, comfort criteria <clears throat> here as a function of the actual uh, natural frequency in which uh, the accelerations dominantly occur. And you see that the longer the period, or the lower the frequency, the higher is the actual threshold where you can perceive vibration, where you think that uh, vibrations are uh, perturbing. Uh, and uh, of course, we also have, again, like a distinguishing factor where we say, uh, do we have to consider, or do we have to look at the accelerations from a wind event of one year or from a wind event of 10 years? And all these uh, AIG uh, curves, uh, then also define certain comfort levels. So buildings, office buildings, high quality buildings, et cetera, are then being labeled according to uh, those H10 to H90 curves. Again, referring to a one year uh, return period event. Um, when it comes to super tall buildings, just like a side note, um, then we have to sometimes consider additional effects as well. Uh, this is from like vibration tests we have done 2008 at the uh, Burj Khalifa. Uh, that's a time history measured. And again, you see the frequency spectra of the, uh, of the tower, but the first mode and the higher modes. And sometimes, especially for, uh, for excitations with the high resonant content, uh, those super tall towers can explain also like a dominant response in the second or well, in the second mode, not the third mode, but the second mode. So um, one has to consider also that uh, the response is not only in one mode, but also in, in higher modes. Uh, and again, <clears throat> the base moment important for the designers to, to uh, design the, the building accordingly. Uh, that is uh, the last value that is relevant for that type of excitation. So what is the solution to reduce vibrations? I think uh, I gave it already away with the title of that talk. Uh, of course, it is a, 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 it is a, 
damping. But um, there are certain ways to achieve that, and also certain ways to uh, to, to to reduce the, the vibrations. Like one thing that needs to be mentioned is base isolation. So I have a video here from uh, uh, of the test and the lab from the UC San Diego, uh, where you see the actual effect of base isolation. So what has been done is that uh, with a very soft support, soft lateral support in this sense, or in this example, uh, you are uh, yeah, reducing the, yeah, the acceleration level of the input basically. Um, of the building, so the building doesn't respond directly to the high and fast accelerations at the, at the base. Uh, we reduce the acceleration level at the base, and accordingly, the dynamic response is being reduced. That's a very, yeah, let's say, understandable principle. But what does it mean for tall buildings? Um, I have to and uh, first of all, what kind of elements are being used to achieve that soft lateral support. So we have elastomeric um, supports, we have uh, lead rubber supports that would also allow for, uh, allow for um, higher uh, energy dissipation. Uh, we have high damping rubber also for high energy dissipation. We have uh, metallic elements, lead extrusion, we have uh, friction and uh, pendulum bearings, rotation ball bearings, and we have helical steel springs. Uh, but what is important is that we also have the capacity of energy dissipation at this point, because uh, what happens is that we achieve relatively large displacements at the base due to, this, due to the, the soft um, support, the soft lateral support, and to avoid that those displacements are becoming too big, you can add like an energy dissipation device. So some years back, we had a very good opportunity to measure or to, to obtain uh, time records of two almost identical buildings or two identical buildings, uh, not very big. It's like a student hostel in Chile um, where we have like a three-story building. One of the buildings is uh, equipped with a base isolation or base control system, as we call it. And uh, the adjacent building has a rigid base. And both were equipped with uh, like a monitoring system. So during an earthquake, we had the chance to uh, measure uh, yeah, the dynamic response of the building. Uh, that is just a picture here of the base control system. Again, it contains of a, a energy dissipation, like a viscoelastic damper at this point. And, uh, a uh, helical spring support system, which doesn't only provide uh, like an isolation in the lateral directions, but also or in the horizontal directions, but also in uh, the vertical directions. So that was the, the base excitation that was measured. And you see uh, the, all three spatial components. And when I mentioned the vertical component, then you see that it's not so insignificant compared to the uh, also to the horizontal components. So the building not only shakes in, um, in, in, in horizontal directions, but also in, in vertical directions. Since gravity and the self weight of the, of the, of the building is higher in, in, in that sense, in, in that direction, um, the response is also a little more reduced. But uh, the trend is that uh, the vertical direction is being more and more considered also for the seismic design. So uh, I promised to show you the results. These are the results uh, that we have measured for the two buildings. And you see like um, reduced accelerations uh, for the building with uh, the base control system. And not only this, when you compare the, uh, the, the levels, the acceleration level for this certain floors, then you see that uh, the acceleration level with the base control system remains uh, constant. So we have that rigid body movement that we saw in, in the experimental video from the UC San Diego. And also when you look at the uh, relative displacement per floor, then you can clearly identify a high interstory drift for the rigid building but the building with BCS 
has like an initial rigid body deflection, but then the interstory drift is uh, relatively small. That's the idea of the base isolation system. But how does that uh, work? Uh, that uh, Sorry, I have to add another or explain another picture. Um, this is like a recent project where an entire building is on a uh, combined uh, base isolation system. And this is to also work with the elastic, uh, with the uh, vertical component of the seismic excitation. So we have a combination of um, uh, like an, a bearing that works in lateral and horizontal direction and uh, bearings in uh, vertical direction. Now, <laughs> how does um, base isolation work for uh, tall buildings? So normally when you design a base isolation, you have a uh, fundamental building of a period and you have a base isolation period. So the, uh, the flexure of the building and the, uh, yeah, the horizontal support in that sense. And you wanna make sure that the fundamental period of the building is, um, no, the frequency has to be higher, sorry, not the, the, it has to be the other way around. So the frequency, the flexure frequency has to be higher than the base isolation frequency. Um, that's just so you don't, or, 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 so, so the, the building is moving the way it's shown here in the graphic, that you have a rigid body movement exactly for that frequency range of the base isolation, and that the flexure appears at higher frequencies. For tall buildings, that is uh, not the case. We often have like fundamental building periods between five to eight seconds for 200 uh, to 250 tall, uh, a meter tall buildings. And in that case, it becomes very difficult to have a base isolation with such a low frequency. Um, in addition, you will have then the, the effect that uh, the, the flexure somehow leads to coupled modes where you have uh, like a an, an, an combination of the lateral displacement at the base isolation and the, the flexure of the building itself. Mm -hmm. So to implement a base isolation, you have to stiffen the superstructure. You have to provide also additional damping already for the superstructure. And uh, you have an increased flexibility at the uh, at the base of the building because the base isolation frequency is, is lower. And uh, you have to deal with these large displacements. Uh, also, you have an increased overturning moment, uh, which leads to higher compression and tension loads at the actual supports. And overall longer periods of the building due to that combination of or the, the increased flexibility of the entire system. Um, longer periods mean that the building gets more perceptible to wind induced vibrations again. So it's uh, not a, a nice trade off at this point. Um, and the effort to, to implement a base isolation for tall buildings is quite high. It has been done uh, in Japan, of course, uh, but they also developed in, in Japan, it was also developed that uh, one works with uh, a mid-story or interstory isolation, where we have uh, a stiff building going up to a certain level, and then the base isolation is not at the base, but at the mid-story. One is also using uh, elements with uh, variable stiffness that can be active, like controlled elements, or uh, elements that are shown here from an example, the Roppongi Grand Tower uh, project of uh, Nikon Sikai, uh, where you have these uh, yeah, additional dampers or uh, separation elements. Uh, they provide a certain stiffness until or up to a certain acceleration level. And only when that acceleration level is exceeded, those uh, braces will yield and provide the flexibility that is needed. Uh, but for normal conditions, they provide sufficient stiffness. Of course, uh, this is not like, a, uh, the system needs to be replaced after an earthquake. Uh, that's why you have those clear separations, but um, 
it only considers extraordinary seismic events. Um, now, <clears throat> what other solutions do we have if we don't want to implement base isolation system? Um, and I said it already, I gave it away, the key is structural damping and the increase of structural damping. And here I've plotted the, uh, just an example from how the lateral acceleration from a certain value can be reduced uh, with the increase of the damping, structural damping ratio. You can also use like a rule of thumb that the acceleration is based on the damping ratio of the building, like the uh, total structural damping ratio, uh, one divided by the square root of the, of the damping ratio. It can be expressed in a little more uh, uh, sophisticated way, uh, where we also distinguish between the response due to a crosswind and the long wind direction, um, uh, using like a reduction fac factor that then is a combination of the inherent damping and the supplementary damping, and plotted uh, these uh, equations plotted in the diagram also show. Uh, the reduction factor based on the supplementary damping. Now, why is there such a big difference between uh, a crosswind direction and the along wind direction? Um, well, the crosswind direction or the crosswind excitation is mostly happening with a very high uh, resonant content of the dynamic response displays that peak that I showed uh, earlier. The uh, long wind direction is more of a stochastical nature. Uh, hence, the, uh, there is also like a multimodal uh, excitation. Uh, and that uh, is being uh, considered in those two uh, reduction factors that we have a much better reduction in the crosswind direction because of the higher resonant uh, component. So um, the question that always uh, occurs is what is the inter inherent structural damping that I can assume for my building? And uh, there, yeah, uh, there's no way of calculating the, the uh, structural damping. You have to uh, use uh, empiric data. And that is a uh, diagram that is actually already quite old from 2008. It was found in the Arab journal um, and it's a summary of buildings that have been investigated <clears throat> where you see the damping ratio again based uh, on the height of the building and the type of the building itself whether it's like a, a steel building or like a steel reinforced like a composite building or just like our sea concrete building um, apparently or of course our sea buildings display higher damping ratios but are not um, built as high yet. Um, that's why I mentioned the date that it's from 2008. In the meantime, we have added a lot more uh, concrete buildings in that range here, but we can confirm from own tests, also from uh, the literature that the damping ratio also for that building is not higher than 1% uh, for uh, let's say small displacements and 1.5% for extraordinary wind events like a 700 year uh, return period. Um, it is uh, like, allow me a hint to a, a temping database. That's the man has lab um, from Professor Karim. He, uh, uh, yeah, uh, introduced that to the community where a lot of buildings are uh, being uh, stored in that database and the damping ratio for that building can be uh, can be uh, checked. Yeah. He had a lot of uh, criteria uh, where you can choose the, the shape of the building, you can uh, choose the structural type, the use, etc. And the damping then that was uh, determined uh, during uh, tests. And you may ask yourself, <clears throat> how do you obtain or how do you uh, determine the damping from, from tests? And we usually do that with uh, ambient vibration tests. So of course it is difficult to artificially excite a 300 meter tall building or even higher building. Uh, there are 
tests where uh, one has tried to excite a building with pull tests, for example, but uh, normally the energy input from these types of tests or, or shakers, whatever, uh, is not sufficient to really uh, gather uh, usable data. So uh, what uh, one usually does is to, to work with ambient vibration tests. Uh, ambient vibration tests means that the uh, building gets like excited by wind or other ambient vibrations. Uh, normally for a tall building, it is the, the, the wind excitation. And then uh, when uh, monitors the vibration for a long time to achieve a certain uh, stochastic uh, certainty. And um, uh, from, from this value, one can obtain the damping using mostly two or three methods. The most commonly used method is the uh, random decrement method. Um, I just show an example here from, from a tower that we have investigated with and without TME, where we also want to uh, document the increase of structural damping. Um, the random decrement method is depending a little bit on the, on the threshold level that you pick. So you have to also do a probability assessment about those values that you determine, but it's a very uh, like plausible and, and reliable method. The other way of dealing with uh, ambient vibration tests is the so-called operational mode analysis, um, where uh, yeah, system identification techniques such as uh, stochastic uh, subspace identification or uh, frequency uh, domain decomposition algorithms are being implemented. It's um, an entire additional world, and I don't want to go too much into details. What you get are uh, so-called stability cards, and uh, and you can determine the damping by either again comparing uh, decay curves in the time domain or comparing uh, like single degree of freedom uh, frequency response functions that are being somehow fitted into uh, the determined structural response data from a tower. Um, but not only there are empiric values, there are also uh, codes that define uh, the inherent structural damping. Uh, define in that sense also means limitations. You should not assume uh, values higher than what is defined in the code. For example, the ISO uh, 4354 code, or then uh, here, a summary from uh, Tamura et al. Uh, that shows the damping value based on the uh, on the building height for like a baseline damping ratios <coughs> for our C buildings and also for steel buildings. So, how can that uh, supplementary structural damping be be achieved? One way of doing this would be distributed damping systems. And uh, I have a very illustrative video here uh, where the damping ratio is probably a little too high. Uh, it's 100% damping ratio, uh, but it shows the, the principle nicely that if we uh, try to dampen the, the flexible displacements of a structure with uh, like distributed damping systems, then of course we also reduce the dynamic response. Um, it could look like this. This is just from like some, some uh, uh, test uh, models to, to uh, play around and to see the certain effects. Uh, but what is important is that those distributed damping systems are like a redundant system. So you have a lot of dampers. Uh, so it is like a redundant system, especially for for seismic issues that is important. We have a direct energy dissipation. So that means that uh, compared to like an isolated system, like a TME at the top, the energy doesn't move all the way up. It will be already dissipated at, uh, on, on the way up to the tower. Uh, let's put it like this. And uh, in addition, we also have a broad uh, effective frequency range in which the damping will be supplied. Meaning, again, if you have like an isolated system, 
which is tuned to a certain mode, it will only be effective in that mode, but the dampers can be, uh, the distributed dampers can be effective in multiple modes. And uh, the ideal uh, model for, for, for a damper, also for distributed damping, would be something like this. We have the tower and we have an, uh, like a displacement of, at the tower top and we have like a viscous damper <laughs> at, the, at the top attached to a rigid point, which doesn't exist, of course. But um, this model can be used to assess the control force that is required uh, to obtain a certain damping. Again, the control force depends on the damping, structural damping ratio you'd like to achieve, the mass of the building, and uh, the frequency, the, the dominant frequency, which, which occurs. And for a initial estimation, that would be a good value to see, okay, what is the, uh, the, uh, the required damping force. So the force depends on displacement, damping ratio, mass, and frequency. Um, now we have certain ways to put these dampers in. Uh, one way would be a relatively simple way to use uh, somehow the displacement at mid-level of a building, which is already uh, sensible. Uh, and then we have uh, enough input for, 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 for the damper to create the, the damping force. The important thing for the damping force is actually the displacement or the velocity to be able to build up that force. And uh, this system has already been built in Milan, Torre Isozaki, or I think now it's called the Allianz building, where we have those uh, dampers attached to a higher level of the building. Another, uh, and then of course the, uh, the importance of that system is that you increase the relative displacement, the higher you attach this, uh, these dampers, um, meaning the effect will also, uh, or, or the, 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 you can basically create a higher uh, control force with the same damping coefficient of the dampers. Um, but it's probably a little misleading. Uh, not the whole thing is the is the damper. Uh, it's only like an extension. The piston itself of the damper is relatively short, uh, just uh, two meters or two point five meters, <laughs> in comparison to the tall building. Um, oops. Sorry. I, Yeah, another option would be to have those uh, diagonal bracing dampers. But here you have to consider that, uh, first of all, you need a much higher amount and the relative displacement is much smaller. So to obtain the same con uh, control force or the same damping force, uh, you either need to have like uh, dampers with a higher uh, damping coefficient, uh, or you just have to uh, somehow find ways to increase. Uh, the, the relative displacement. If you are looking at these two examples here, um, and again, we use the, uh, like a, a, a wind input, um, and we have these two combinations and the reduction that can be achieved, um, then we can look at this time history here, where we plotted the acceleration versus time for the two options. For dampers is the uh, dampers outside at the bit story level. 100 dampers would be the dampers where you have a diagonal bracing at each floor. Um, then you see that uh, with those four dampers, you can actually achieve a much higher reduction uh, given the fact that the dampers all have the same uh, damping coefficient. So that's what I just said. Since we are uh, achieving a higher relative displacement that interacts with the dampers, uh, we can also create a higher damping force or control force, uh, hence the reduction that can be achieved is higher too. That's for the case that we have wind excitation. If you look uh, at for the case that we have a seismic excitation, um, the results are different 
there we achieve a higher uh, reduction of the accelerations uh, with those distributed 100 dampers. Uh, why is that? Because we have also higher frequencies that are contributing to the dynamic behavior. So here, the broad uh, frequency range and also the, uh, the direct energy dissipation plays a big role uh, and it can be illustrated with those results that I'm showing here. There are certain ways to attach those distributed dampers to, to the building or to the, to the frames of the building. Uh, all have the objective to increase the relative displacement of, of the dampers. Again, that is required to, to be able to create bigger um, damping forces, control forces with the same or with uh, uh, yeah, to, to avoid that you need too high uh, damping coefficients uh, of your damping devices. Now one particular example I'd like to introduce is uh, so-called damped uh, outriggers. We have an outrigger in your building um, and a flex or a, a joint between the outer columns and the actual outrigger, uh, as it is shown right here. So you have the outrigger, you have the out, uh, like the uh, outrigger wall, you have parameter columns and a so-called flexible joint between the columns and the outrigger. And the relative displacement between the outrigger wall and the parameter columns then again can be used again to implement dampers. That has been done uh, or invented by Smith and Wilford of Arab. Uh, and they have implemented that the first time at uh, a tower in Manila, uh, Shangri-La Place. And just to give you an idea about the design values for these, <coughs> for these dampers, each of these dampers has a uh, damping coefficient of about uh, 1,000 meganewton seconds per meter. So that's quite a substantial value for dampers. So um, I'm saying that because we do develop dampers and we do test dampers a lot. Uh, this is a video from uh, a wall damper. So that's the way just to attach the damper in the bracing. Um, and one can determine the damping uh, parameters of such devices uh, through a force displacement diagram. So that here uh, is exemplarily shown like a force displacement diagram for a sinusoidal load, um, where you measure <coughs> force and, sorry, it should be displacement. Um, and then you plot force versus the displacement right here for the amount of cycles that you're testing. So with that force displacement diagram, you are able to obtain the energy that is being dissipated, which is the area within that uh, within that loop, uh, and depending on the type of damping component you're using, you also have an elastic component. So, for a viscoelastic damper, as shown in the video before, you also have like an uh, elastic energy component, uh, and from both components, you are able to determine the damping coefficient and the dynamic stiffness that arises from, from the viscoelastic component. Uh, here, such a component is uh, shown as it is attached to like a, a building frame uh, where we use actually the already introduced <coughs> setups like a Chevron setup to increase the relative displacement uh, interacting with the damper. Um, but there are different damping components that uh, you can choose. Uh, we have uh, viscous fluid dampers, we have uh, viscoelastic dampers, we have uh, metallic dampers, and we have uh, friction dampers. And each of these damping components has a different uh, hysteretic uh, behavior. So when you look at those uh, viscous fluid dampers, then uh, sometimes it is propagated that they have the ideal uh, viscous behavior, which means that uh, like the force uh, the reaction force of the damper is uh, 
directly proportional to the to the displacement. So meaning if you increase the displacement, then you also increase the force. Um, of course, you have to consider the direction in which the, the device is acting, but the force displacement diagram would look like this. For the viscoelastic dampers that, uh, no, but as I said, <laughs> the, the viscous fluid uh, dampers, that, that would be the ideal constellation. Often uh, due to the construction of those dampers, you have uh, a different behavior in tension or compression direction. And that's why the force deflection diagram uh, looks more like this, which also means that you have a uh, not direct proportional behavior. You have a progressive or decreasive behavior, depending on uh, the, how the, the damper is being set up. Now, the viscoelastic uh, damper is the one that I showed from the test, um, where actually the angle, the, of inclination uh, from the hysteresis loop is uh, defined by like the phase angle, the phase angle between the reaction force and the uh, displacement. Uh, one can say that the, the, the smaller this angle, uh, the higher is the elastic component. But uh, we have a relative, or we have a uh, uh, the same behavior in tension and compression direction, uh, but we also have to consider that there are like restoring forces coming from the elastic component. Um, now, metallic uh, dampers are uh, including the, the fact that the metallic dampers are yielding at some point. So uh, if you can uh, build up a, a big force at small displacements, and then you have the yielding uh, where you can achieve big displacements, but uh, you don't build up any more uh, additional force. Um, in the end, those are uh, showing big areas. So the, the damping or the dissipation capacity is relatively high. And uh, the last type would be friction dampers, where uh, you have to overcome a certain force threshold to, to overcome the friction in the damper. Then you have a big uh, displacement without building up additional force. And then in the, uh, in the backwards direction, you have the same effect. You build up a force without displacement until friction has been overcome uh, and back. And this definitely provides the highest damping or dissipation capacity, but uh, at a certain price, but you don't have restoring forces, etc. So when you look at the advantages for all these systems, um, yeah, I think one very big advantage, especially when it comes to uh, the application for to protect the building from wind-induced vibrations, that those uh, two types are already activated at low displacements. That you have, uh, yeah, good good behavior also for modeling. I think that's important for for the engineers, and that. Uh, those uh, devices can uh, stay within the building and don't have to be replaced even when uh, like large seismic or wind events have occurred. So uh, the, the, the offside of those metallic and friction dampers can provide large uh, dissipation capacities or that they have to be replaced after, after those events. And for the friction dampers, is that we, uh, they, yeah, the interface conditions change, so we have a nonlinear behavior, uh, etc. And uh, again, since we don't have a restoring force, you have to combine uh, often like an, an elastic component with those friction dampers in addition. Now, uh, there are not only uh, distributed damping systems. I've mentioned that already. We also have like isolated damping systems. And one of the uh, most commonly used devices would be uh, the tune mass damper. This is uh, <laughs> uh, from a TMD that we have implemented to a building. And I uh, thought it was like really, really nice to <laughs> have the, the, the room in which the TMD is uh, labeled like this. Uh, let me just explain uh, 
briefly what a TMD is from a theoretical point and um, not with the help of a tall building because as I said, it is difficult to artificially excite a building. And that's why we have to go back to a footbridge uh, like in this case, which is easier to excite and which is also a broad uh, field of application for two mass dampers. Uh, the bridge that we are seeing here uh, has also a very low degree of uh, structural damping. So it's about 0.5% compared to like a tall building with has, which has an inherent damping of maybe 1%, almost the same level. And what you see is when those people walk off the bridge deck is that the damping is so low. And now we have uh, installed a device underneath, which consists of an like elastically supported mass that counteracts to the vibrations of the, the main structure. And by doing so, it gets basically the energy from the main building gets transferred into the additional mass. And there uh, it will be dissipated by a damping element. Uh, and this way, the, uh, the, the, the energy is being extracted from the main structure. And this is what we want. And this is how we increase or how we provide supplementary damping. So uh, when you look at the frequency response function of a uh, one degree of freedom system, then depending on the inherent damping, you have a, a amplification curve, which looks like this. Uh, that is the one degree of freedom system. And with by attaching like an additional mass, you are able to split up the frequencies into two frequencies. And for a frequency ratio of one, you would entirely eliminate this, the dynamic response of the main system. But that's just like a, a case that happens in theory or for a very narrow band excitation. Uh, in reality, as I have already mentioned, we have a broad band stochastic excitation, either due to wind or due to earthquake. Um, and we also have changes of the uh, natural frequency of the, of the main system over time with concrete cracking or uh, temperature conditions, etc. So uh, as soon as you move out of that frequency ratio of one, you would have like an, a very high amplification again. And that's what you can avoid by adding an additional damping element to that mass. Uh, so you still have a small amplification in those two distinguished frequencies, um, but the overall amplification is much smaller than for the system uh, without a TMD. Of course, we're not talking about small masses for tall buildings, as it is shown on the, on the video here. We are implementing much, much bigger masses. This is uh, the biggest team that uh, GERB has uh, uh, yeah, um, implemented so far as, as one single unit. It's uh, 590 tons uh, in, uh, in New York City for uh, one of the towers at the Hudson Yard development. Or uh, that is another uh, TMD example from New York with a TMD mass of about 450 tons. So a little bigger. But talking about mass, um, you may wonder what is the mass I need to, uh, to work with when considering a TMD or when considering the implementation of a TMD. And uh, for this initial, uh, initial uh, dimensioning, uh, you can use the, the graph that is shown over here, where we have uh, the, the mass ratio, which is the ratio between the modal mass of the tower or the, the TMD mass versus the modal mass of the tower, um, and the effective damping that we can achieve with the implementation of the system. Uh, depending, of course, on the inherent damping there is. So the higher the inherent damping, the higher, of course, then is the uh, the effective damping with TMD, but you can see that this is clearly a function of the mass ratio. So the higher the TMD mass, the bigger is the effective damping that we can achieve. Uh, for this graph, I have uh, assumed uh, like a random excitation of white noise, um, and it can be 
expressed uh, with that formula. Uh, and all these results assume an optimal tuning and also an optimal tuning damping. Uh, if you don't consider white noise, but like in harmonic excitation, you can see that the damping ratio is already even higher. Uh, that again is the resonant contribution that I mentioned earlier. Now, uh, what are the optimum values? Uh, for white noise excitation, the optimization is different than for harmonic loading. Some of you who have already uh, worked with tuned mass dampers may have uh, heard the optimization according to Den Hartog, uh, who uh, introduced the TMD principle in the 1920s, I think. Um, but those are not valid for uh, white noise excitation or for stochastic excitation. Uh, so here we would have to consider a different optimization criteria. Um, those criteria, again, do not consider the inherent damping. And uh, uh, because you can only develop a closed uh, formulation when you consider that the uh, initial system has, has uh, no damping that easily with an analytical uh, solution. Uh, although um, Asami had tried to, to, to formulate like a closed uh, analytical solution for that problem. But as you can see, it's quite um, difficult to, <laughs> to, to handle. Uh, so uh, it would be easier to use that approach uh, if, uh, with the numerical results. And with the numerical results, we can obtain curves that are shown in these two charts where we have the optimum frequency again based on the inherent damping and the mass ratio and also the optimum uh, damping ratio of the TMD again based on sorry uh, the inherent damping and the, the mass ratio. So those curves can be used for an um, uh, initial dimensioning of the TMD that is required or the TMD mass and the TMD parameters that are required. But uh, one also has to have some practical considerations. This is a video from the TMD of the 432 Park Avenue Tower. Yes, the one from the, uh, from the New York Times article. Uh, but what you can see is that the displacements of, and I think it's also about 500 tons, uh, uh, are quite significant. The people do not seem to bother because everything moves relatively slow. But uh, the practical limitation of a TMD is definitely defined by the TMD travel. So um, we can obtain the displacement ratio um, of the TMD, again, based on the mass ratio, <coughs> considering optimum damping again. And we have to see whether this is still something that is feasible or not. If not, uh, there are only two ways to deal with it. Uh, one way would be to increase the mass, of course, then we also reduce the displacement. Uh, or we can increase the TMB damping ratio. Uh, the offside of that is that we would reduce the efficiency of the system. But um, th this then is the point where you have to do a little more detail. Uh, analysis uh, when implementing a TMD to see what is the final specification at the end. Um, our considerations in general, not only from a dynamic perspective, but when providing such a system um, are the following. We have to yeah, provide a TMD ideally with like minimum space requirements. As I said uh, already, a TMD is uh, meant to be installed at the top of the building. This is very uh, lucrative space. Um, so we should not use too much of it. Then of course we have to provide a big tuning range. Why is that? Um, because <laughs> the engineers, and I'm, I'm, I'm uh, not serious here, are not able to define the, uh, the fundamental pe uh, periods directly. That's, um, and that's why I'm kidding, a difficult task, because especially if with concrete buildings, you have to approach this from two sides. So if you want to play safe from the structural engineering point of view, you do not consider the stiffest uh, 
material data for, for the concrete. Uh, you try to assume like, uh, like a certain uh, reduction of the material capacities just to be on the safe side. But that then leads to uh, like a, uh, yeah, a deviation from, from uh, the uh, actually then realistically measured frequency of the building since the building might be stiffer. Also, there are uh, effects like cracking in the concrete that may change the, 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 the uh, natural frequencies of the tower over time. So to cope with all these uncertainties, uh, a big tuning range is required. We try to accommodate uh, as big TMD displacements as possible because that is to avoid to put a too high mass on top of the tower uh, and to save costs that are uh, <laughs> connected with that considerations. And we also try to provide like a maintenance uh, free design and a high durability of that device. Again, cost issue um, also. Uh, um, issues like for the handover there's a developer that hands the building over to to the owners at some point uh, and they want to make sure everything is is, uh, is, is, is uh, taken care of and lastly but very important because uh, th this is also like a cost driving factor it's an easy and fast installation so um, to, to get up masses like 500 tons uh, to the top of the tower you usually uh, using a tower crane and the operation of the tower crane is a, a very uh, costly factor at this point. So yeah, three keywords, robustness, adjustability, and even the possibility to do like a replacement at some point in case of that the modal parameters have changed over time, etc. Uh, those are the, the keywords. So what times of TMDs do we have? Um, or what are on the market. So uh, the one that I've shown already, 450 tons, that is a TMD that has been designed as a pendulum TMD. It's a very simple system. As you can see, we have a mass hanging off uh, like a support. Uh, we can tune the frequency by adjusting the pendulum lengths and we have a damping component at the bottom. Um, very simple, uh, the benefit of that type of system is, is again that it works at very small deflections of the of the tower already um, you can see a video from that system here during like a windy event let's put it like this uh, where uh, we see the team moving counteracting providing uh, supplementary damping the whole thing has its dimensions as you can see and that's the tower uh, from an aerial view, we have that support frame that sits on top of the roof and the TMD outside um, uh, working from, from like a side view, uh, everything is hidden under behind that curtain wall uh, or the crown uh, curtain wall. So that is a very uh, simple system and you can actually, you can still have the option whether you want to have a TMD or not. <laughs> Uh, during the construction process. That's also often considered that uh, people are monitoring the building, uh, assessing the natural frequencies. And if there was like already some um, considerations, is a TMB possible or not? And it was depending on the, the building period, then there even uh, maybe decisions for or against the TMB and that type of uh, construction allows a relatively uh, late engagement in the construction stage. But the problem, of course, with the single pendulum TMB is that the pendulum length that is required uh, is relatively high for buildings with a long period or a small, uh, uh, yeah, fundamental frequency. So um, for buildings that are now considered to be super tall buildings, we have uh, periods of building frequencies between 0.1 to 0.15 Hertz. And for this, we need a space between uh, 10 and 20 meters uh, if we want to build a TMB as a single pendulum system. So uh, to avoid that, uh, one can uh, implement a so-called folded pendulum system where we have the TMB mass 
hanging on an intermediate frame and the intermediate frame again is hanging uh, on outer ropes that are supported by the structure uh, that allows actually to uh, reduce the building or the height of the TMD system, uh, as you can see here. Uh, and the pendulum length that is effective then is like a combination of the inner and the outer ropes. Uh, that's an example here from the Sport City Tower in Doha, uh, a system that has been implemented now 14 years ago, I think 2006, we've done that. Um, and is still operating without any uh, any issues. But um, of course, you can use that principle uh, of for the pendulum also for even lower frequencies and a higher amount of uh, intermediate frames. This is from a prototype where actually the TMD mass is only that small mass in here, but we have uh, two frames inside each other to increase the uh, uh, the, the period of the of the TMD, and uh, for that building that I've already shown in the uh, introduction slide, we have also uh, implemented a folded pendulum TMD, uh, which has this specialty that it works uh, with different tuning frequencies in the two directions. We have a, a low frequency or long period in the one direction where the folded pendulum is active. And uh, in the second direction, we have, oops, sorry. In the second direction, uh, the uh, folded pendulum is inactive and that's why we can achieve higher tuning frequencies. So that is uh, just an impression from the installation uh, of that TV system. Um, going something well there there's never mind um, there are also other types uh, with the same objective to reduce the height of the of the TMD itself uh, that is a system that has been introduced by uh, motioning or WDI uh, the inverted pendulum system uh, here, just like a graph, how it is integrated in the building. Uh, the interesting thing is that it uses um, like an, a countermass and uh, and uh, rods to virtually increase the uh, the point of rotation for that system. Uh, accordingly, the tuning frequency that can be achieved is lower than what has actually been defined with the with the pendulum length itself. But uh, this is a rather, from my understanding, complicated uh, setup. And uh, to cope with all the requirements I mentioned earlier, we had uh, the idea to say, well, we are a, a German company and in Germany, we build uh, good cars. So why not also put a TME on, on wheels? Um, and that is what we, uh, we have developed in the past that we have a, a, a real system TMDs that doesn't need um, any pendulum or rope support at all. It's all sitting on wheels. And the big advantage is that we can adjust the frequency uh, only with the help of, of uh, elastic components, tension springs. Uh, so we have the opportunity to achieve very low tuning frequencies without uh, needing a much uh, vertical space. Uh, these are some of the examples that we have done in the smaller scope. Uh, this is the TMD move-in for, uh, in this case, the, the tuning frequency was about 0.17 Hertz and uh, also the displacements of the TMD mass. But the problem with those TMDs, I mean, <laughs> the problem that has been solved, of course, uh, is that uh, we have to look at the actual breakaway uh, force. Um, so there's, of course, friction, and we have to overcome friction, and we have to overcome the friction at a level that should be 
below the defined comfort criteria. So for according to those comfort criteria that I've introduced earlier, you can define acceleration levels and you have to define a friction coefficient for these devices to ensure that the system works already below those comfort criteria. Um, the other thing about friction is that once the GMD is working and it's like being uh, uh, displaced in, in, in one direction, you will have a restoring force. And the restoring force depends again on the stiffness of those springs for the uh, tuning. So the restoring force uh, has to be uh, bigger than the, uh, the rolling resistance. So, uh, and, and here in this curve, we have calculated the uh, restoring force depending again on the tuning frequency. <clears throat> and for with normal uh, standard uh, bearings, basically, uh, you would have a problem uh, for tuning frequencies longer than uh, or below 0.1 hertz, periods longer than 10 seconds. So here we have to implement systems with a uh, reduced friction. Uh, but as I said, the problem has been solved. Uh, this is me pushing uh, 60 tons, uh, just with the, with the, with the leg press. Uh, and that is only because we can implement those uh, uh, low friction systems. Uh, the whole system that I've shown at the beginning, those three TMDs were installed here in the, uh, another building in New York City, 58 Sutton, where we have implemented three of these uh, big devices. This is a picture from the mock-up without the actual TMD mass, but the, 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 the real system. And as you can see, the big advantage is not only that you don't have to use ropes, it's also that the floors, uh, only one floor basically has to have the capacity to support uh, that additional mass. And another issue is that it's like a modular uh, system. Uh, at some points, we have assembled those devices uh, not using the tower crane. I mentioned that earlier. This means uh, like a costly adventure. We could use the the hoist to bring up uh, all the components with the with the, with the hoist of the building. Uh, to yeah complete the selection of. Uh, isolated damping systems. Uh, we also have the opportunity to use slosh dampers. Uh, here again, like a model to show how everything works. So the water builds up waves that counteract with the building and uh, the energy is being dissipated by uh, actually turbulences in the water that are being created. Uh, I think that is just showing the example, but also showing the big disadvantage of that system that it requires a lot of space. Um, when you look at the sloshing frequency that you'd like to achieve, then it's a function of the length of that tank. And uh, okay, the length here is uh, displayed in, in, in feed, but uh, for low frequencies, you already need like a significant size of uh, of tank to, to achieve those, those low frequencies. Also important is the effectiveness that you'd like to have, which depends on the uh, depth of the water. So not only do you need like a, a, a long tank, also need a big tank, you need to have a high uh, tank length to achieve high participation factors. Uh, and of course, the mass that is required for a TMD is also required as water, which has uh, a much, much lower density. So um, it's certainly the, the cheapest option because you don't have to uh, have a high installation effort and you don't have to bring up a lot of steel, just building a tank and maybe those uh, baffles for frequency adjustment, etc. cetera. But uh, uh, the space requirements are, are much bigger. And uh, another uh, type of uh, liquid damper would be like a tuned liquid uh, column damper, where we have a changing, interchanging level of uh, uh, water that is also can be tuned by 
the arrangement and also by an orifice at the bottom uh, to create a counteracting force and the, the energy dissipation then of that element is again because we have to have that fluid flowing back and forth and, 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 and uh, dissipating energy just by uh, yeah the kinematic friction of the liquid on, on, the, on the walls. Um, yeah, a famous example for that type of damper is the Comcast Center in uh, Philadelphia, um, where you see that the, like an entire floor has been used for, for this uh, tuned liquid column damper. Um, <clears throat> now I uh, want to conclude with a, a summary. And uh, I have to say that all these summarizing damping technologies have been uh, done, or, or summarizing the, the damping technologies in this talk has been done with the help of uh, a lot of uh, colleagues and experts, uh, which have been contributing to a book uh, from the Council of Tall Buildings and Urban Habitats, edited by uh, Alberto Lago, Dario Chabuco, and Anthony Wood, um, which can be yeah, obtained from, from the CTBUH. Uh, that is a book which has much more information about the damping technologies than that, that I have introduced in this talk today. But um, this book has a summary, and I just wanted to show you the summary. Uh, for these certain types of uh, damping devices as a conclusion. So for the distributed damping system, uh, fluid viscous dampers can be used, viscoelastic dampers can be used. Um, and the big advantage is that we have uh, like an uh, instantaneously added damping to the structure already at low amplitudes that we have uh, like an distributed damping for broader frequencies as I have said. And um, of course, there are some drawbacks for the systems, especially the uh, viscous dampers uh, working with uh, pressurized sealed uh, items uh, that have to be replaced at some point, uh, depending on the, uh, on the use and the mileage uh, they're, uh, they're facing. And accordingly, the cost of the, uh, the level of cost is, is uh, relatively high. Also, the the uh, those type of dampers have to be implemented already during the design process, uh, during the design process, and also during the construction process. So there is no way of uh, having some some retrofit measures during the actual construction stage. Then uh, we have these types of uh, metallic dampers, friction dampers, which are solely an option for uh, for seismic issues, not just uh, wind, uh, not wind, uh, but only for seismic issues. Here, I think the biggest offset is that we have to replace those devices. And accordingly, they are cheap uh, pair at the beginning, but due to the replacement, if necessary, uh, the cost level is increasing. Then we have the option of using tuned mass dampers, tuned liquid dampers. Those are most, for tall buildings only efficient for, for wind excitation. I showed you that uh, for especially the seismic excitation, we have those multiple modes that play a role. Uh, those cannot address with just one single uh, isolated damping system. Um, here we have the advantages that we can uh, do a tuning on site, that we have an, uh, the possibility to do like a retrofit installation if necessary. And uh, uh, from a cost factor, of course, the tuned liquid damper or slosh damper is uh, a very uh, reasonable, uh, is with reasonable costs. The TMD is already higher costs, but in general, also a cheaper option than equipping each floor uh, with dampers or having uh, sophisticated uh, damper systems uh, that have to deal with uh, bigger strokes or provide bigger damping coefficients. Um, lastly, we have the, uh, the base isolation system that I've mentioned. I think uh, only at higher costs for uh, 
yeah, adjusting the building to be working with a base isolation system um, is, is, makes it yeah, not very lucrative for tall buildings at all. And uh, one thing we haven't discussed at all, uh, and uh, I blame the time, uh, the lack of time, but uh, it's definitely an interesting topic, is the uh, application of active or semi-active devices. Maybe this is something we can talk about in the future. We have done that uh, as well for, uh, for long span floors, also for buildings where we have developed like a hybrid system. But uh, uh, that's just a spoiler maybe for the next time. So thank you for your time uh, to bear with me the whole time. And I think there are maybe some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mainhart, for sharing your knowledge and experience in the damping devices. This is very interesting and inf informative talk. So let's continue our Q&A session. If you ha have any question, please uh, type in the chat box. The first question is, the elliptical shape of viscous damper hysteresis is based on sinusoidal excitation. Under the real uh, wind and ground acceleration, does the hysteresis shape change? Uh, from the force deflection diagram, yes, because we have, but it's due to the uh, variation of the displacement. If So if we would um, uh, normalize the displacement uh, and normalize the reaction force, then we would have the same uh, force deflection diagram. But for, let's say, an excitation, like a stochastic excitation, or for an, uh, like a, uh, cycles with like an, an, an varying deflections, then the force deflection shape would look different. That's correct. Uh -huh. okay. but, but in the end, uh, um, what matters is basically the area in that elliptical uh, curve. Uh, and if you then correlate the, the dissipated energy again with the displacement and force levels, then you will still obtain the same damping coefficient. So the damping coefficient remains constant, uh, only the, 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 the shape of the hysteretic curve would look different. But uh, as I said, it's only because the displacement levels are different. I see. Okay, next question is, in practice, not in theory, what is the maximum sublimate damping that could be achieved in tall building? Mm -hmm. So, um, I can, so my experience, my only, uh, my experience is limited at this point to uh, the maximum damping that we can achieve with the installation of, the, of, of a TMD. And uh, I've shown that graph at the, during the, uh, sorry. <laughs> should, should share my screen. So, so um, yeah. So here uh, we have about um, a, a damping ratio of uh, even seven to 8% uh, total supplementary damping. And that is um, a very high value uh, we consider it as a high value because we had these high demands from 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 uh, uh, from the wind engineering or the predicted accelerations that were uh, coming from the wind engineer. So that is a value that would already be relatively high, seven to eight percent structural damping. So this seven to eight percent is the additional damping. No, that's the total. That's the total. So we had uh, so. You see, we had started with 1%, 1.2%, mm -hmm. and then uh, we have uh, installed a TMD with a mass ratio of 3.5%, so that's relatively high, especially for tall buildings. And uh, for this, we have achieved like a uh, structural damping of 7 to 8%. I see. But um, uh, it it's, uh, was defined by the, the demands uh, from, from the wind lab. Um, normally we implement like TMD systems with 1% damping ratio maximum, and then we gain uh, maybe from 1% up, uh, we can gain like a supplementary damping of two to 3%. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, next question is, uh, how can you do the passive design? Any recommendations? How can, sorry, I, I... How can we do the passive uh, damping uh, design and any recommendations on that? The passive design of the building or the passive design of the TMB? Uh, dampers, oh. passive, uh, passive dampers. Okay. Um, yeah, as I said, so for, for passive TMD, the initial uh, dimensioning would be based on, on that curve, how much supplementary damping I can achieve depending on the mass ratio. And that is just a starting point. And then we would use a little more uh, detailed analysis. Often we use like an uh, like a finite element model of the building where we implement the TMD and then we also get all the, the interface loads. We also can con, uh, investigate the behavior of the TMD during uh, seismic excitation, for example, just to define all these interface loads. But that would be the first start would, would always go with that, uh, with that curve that I showed. Okay. Uh, so the and then for the for the for the distributed damping systems, uh, also the same way as I showed it, like you would start with the idea that you have a building and you have a damper at the top attached to a fixed point. Um, uh, in, in German, we always joke it's an air hook, <laughs> so uh, uh, it doesn't exist, but it. It gives you a good indication about the, the damping force uh, that is required, and by knowing the, the the displacement, either the modal displacement or the actual displacement due to certain load scenarios, you can also derive the uh, required uh, damping coefficient of the damping devices. Okay, this will be the last question uh, for due to the time limitation. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you measure the actual damping of the building? Right. So um, measuring the damping of the building is being done with ambient vibration tests. So we take time records uh, of uh, uh, yeah, one, two, three hours, even longer. Um, and then we use that recorded time domain signals to uh, de determine the damping with the so-called random decrement method. Um, random decrement method means that you take the, the time record you've measured and you uh, check whenever a certain threshold is exceeded. Uh, then you take that segment um, and average that segment with other segments that uh, you have taken out of that time record when the threshold is exceeded. And due to the uh, averaging process, you get a so-called random de decrement signature. And the random decrement signature is what you see here in that slide, uh, which is basically looking like a decaying curve. And from the decaying curve, you can obtain uh, the damping of the building. So that's the like an illustrative way to explain how, how damping can be obtained. Of course, uh, there are certain effects that you have to consider. There is like a displacement depending damping, but uh, the, the method allows you to define the level, like the threshold, 10% uh, of the maximum acceleration, 30% of the maximum acceleration to see whether there is a dependency on the, on the determined uh, damping values, for example. So displacement dependent damping can also be determined with uh, random decrement method. Okay. okay, thank you very much. And thank, uh, thank you very much uh, for the participants and your time. So I look forward to, to uh, seeing you in the next events. <laughs> yes. Uh, thanks a lot again for the opportunity and uh, uh, I'm definitely going to be joining the next event. I think it's a, a very good, good opportunity for uh, the community also in the national community to get together. Thank you. Thank you. Please stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.